All right, folks, it is 6.02, so we are going to get underway. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the, the first in the Highlands Biological Foundation Zonar Conservation Lecture Series for 2021. This year, we are hosting the lectures in a variety of formats and spaces, including virtual. So thank you for joining us here on Zoom tonight. You may have noticed at this point that this is a meeting, not a webinar. So if you'd like to start your video, please feel free to do so. I suggest that you select the speaker view, which is available in the upper right hand corner to best see those who are participating in tonight's discussion. Um, gallery view will give you everybody. <laughs> As Rose will be asking us to respond uh, throughout the discussion, please remember you're welcome to unmute yourself to participate, but then remember to mute yourself. So when you are finished speaking with this many folks, it could get loud quickly. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Paige Engelbrexen and I'm the Nature Center Education Specialist for the Highlands Biological Foundation. And together with Winter Gary, our Communications and Events Coordinator, we'll be supporting the discussion tonight. We work for the foundation, which supports research and education in the Southern Appalachians through programs like this one. And the Zahner Conservation Lecture Series, if you're not familiar with it, began in the 1930s and focuses on natural history, conservation, and tonight, bringing in art. You may have noted the lecture is being recorded. We are going to trim it down and edit it to put it on our YouTube page where you can find the remainder of our 2021 lectures as the season progresses, as well as our other virtual programming. I am pleased to introduce Karen Patterson, our Education Committee Chair, who will be introducing our speaker tonight. So first, let me apologize for this um, musical chairs thing. I live in a little narrow valley and my internet is um, sketchy at best. So I figured if you really wanted me to start this thing, you needed to see me up here. Tonight, we're gonna talk about a book called A Literary Field Guide to the Southern, Appala to Southern Appalachia. It was edited by three people, one of whom Rose McClarney is here tonight. This is, this is an atypical field guide. It's about species that occur in a very specific, specifically defined area that they have identified as their, their version of Southern Appalachia. Um, Typical field guides give you habitat and the range and the physical characteristics to identify species so that you can go out in the field and find them and know that what you're looking at, but it does not tell you anything about the animal. It doesn't give you any um, essence of the animal. This book, the literary part of it does. It Rose and her fellow editors selected 60 species 60 poets and 60 visual artists to describe these species that they picked. So yes, you could probably identify the animals from their description, but more they're giving you what they, some kind of a connection, they're trying to explain or describe or give you insights into their connection of what these, I call them animals, but it's really organisms, trees, bats, birds, slugs, all kinds of things, giving you their perceptions, their um, essence of these animals. So the three editors are Chick Gaddy, who is identified as L.L. Gaddy on the book. He's the natural history editor. If you're from South Carolina, you know him as Chick, and you know that he is one of our last true uh, natural historians. Um, the other two editors are Laura Gray Street, who teaches creative writing at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. And finally, Rose McClarney, who is, teaches at Auburn, teaches in the English department at Auburn, and grew up in North Carolina. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rose. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm sorry that my I look a little gray. Um, it's just bad lighting in the office. I, <laughs> I hope that the, I, the, what I have to read to you from this book will be more colorful than my picture. But anyways, thank you all for coming and thank you uh, for that introduction. A Literary Field Guide to Southern Appalachia um, is a combined literary and natural history anthology that I co-edited with the editors that were mentioned, um, L. Gaddy, natural history editor, and Laura Gray Street, the other poet working on this project with me. Um, and it's a book that's a guide to knowing the inhabitants of Southern Appalachia, which is one of the most biodiverse areas on earth, 
as species, but also in broader poetic senses. And so for each species in this anthology, Laura Gray Street and I commissioned a poem from a Southern Appalachian writer and an original illustration uh, by a regional artist. And we wrote a conversational piece of prose providing natural history and identification information um, in collaboration with the natural history editor, L.L. Gaddy. Um, or in the case of the section about fish, uh, we worked with my father, the biologist, some of you may know, uh, Bill McClarney, who works in Macon County and, and elsewhere, um, to write these fish accounts, which I'll say, um, we didn't have to edit very much. Uh, so he gets a lot of credit for, for the prose in, in that section. Um, but this is a, a typical field guide. It's not supposed to replace you know, your, your Peterson guide or whatever, but it is supposed to help you engage with a, a different part of your mind um, being interested in your natural surroundings. And it does sort of build off some of the longer history of field guides. Originally field guides were not um, completely objective publications. They often had in their early days, very descriptive or even you know, rhapsodic writing in them. And you can read in the uh, introduction to this book more about some of those early field guides. What really defined early field guides was that they were books that were small enough, unlike most science books of the time, um, to be carried out in the field. Uh, and so in that sense, we are uh, not so far from the original model of, of a field guide, but we also like to think that um, maybe, you know, we did something different with this book. Um, and we were following in the footsteps, not only of historic field guides, but of field guides that were produced um, in other areas. There was first a literary field guide, or the first one I'm aware of, that incorporated creative writing poetry um, in the, in the modern day with illustrations and uh, these conversational pieces of prose. The first one was for, for the Sonoran Desert. And simultaneously when we were working on this one, uh, there were some poets working on one to, uh, for Vermont. And I know that there are now literary field guides being produced for um, the Pacific Northwest and, and maybe for other areas. So I'm interested to see how this uh, form of book continues to spread and evolve. Um, as the editor, of this project, one of the most challenging aspects was maybe getting specialists in the different areas to work together. So the visual artists, the creative writers, the scientists, but probably actually getting the parts of my own uh, brain to, to work together, you know, so that I could engage with all those people with different specialties. And some of the questions that my co-editors and I were um, grappling with as we put together this book is, how can poets be allowed to be creative um, even though we've assigned them a subject? And at what point might you know, we impinge on that creativity if we needed to um, correct factual content? Uh, how can we write prose that's informative but that's a little more inviting um, than the usual field guide fare? How can an illustrator represent a species in such a way that it's recognizable but not necessarily be constrained by some of the expectations that you might have for a technical illustration in the usual field guide that would show, you know, the exact number of inches of the wingspan or, or something like that. Um, and there are also some larger questions that come along with a multidisciplinary project like this. Um, and I think that they're relevant considerations for lots of people just thinking about observing the natural world or observing what's happening in art, whether or not you're an editor. Uh, and some, some of these questions are um, about communication. You know, when are precision and objectivity and consistency what's needed? And when are conveying sensory impressions and evoking emotions and creating metaphors and associations uh, the most effective strategies? And how are accuracy and artistry different or alike? And I invite you to kind of continue thinking about some of those questions this evening as we're looking at some of the content from the book and uh, especially time allowing, I get you all to do some creative writing exercises of your own. Maybe if you're not usually a creative writer, having that larger framework will, will make you give yourself a little poetic license when we get to that stage. Um, before we get to the interactive element of discussion and look at some poems in detail, I'll just say a little bit more about the process of putting together this book. Um, one of the challenges as an editor was defining the region to be covered. Uh, you're probably aware that Southern Appalachia, 
or Appalachia, none of those terms are definitively agreed upon uh, geographical areas that everybody understands in the same way. Um, you can find lots and lots of different definitions of what Appalachia is and includes. Uh, but we ended up defining Southern Appalachia rather than in terms of state lines, um, in terms of mountain ranges and other elements of the environment. Uh, so for instance, you know, we wouldn't just say North Carolina because we wouldn't want to include the Piedmont and the coastal area, the environment's very different there. Um, just the mountainous end. So we ended up with a kind of funny shaped map and doing some strange cross-checking to see where our con potential contributors actually lived in, in their states or where they had grown up, things like that. Um, and we ended up working with uh, John C. Campbell's definition of Southern Appalachia um, because it was informed by topography and biology and human culture. And also conveniently, it dipped just down in Alabama which is where Auburn University, where I teach, uh, is located. So that was helpful because they were you know, supporting this book. So, <laughs> that's, but also there was, I liked finding some commonalities in the environment there, which often seems quite different to me from the North Carolina environment that is so dear to me. Um, and this book helped me, helped me learn more about that area as well. Another challenge we had as editors was figuring out what species we were going to include and getting that list down to a book size tally of 60, which is what publishers had recommended. Uh, so 60 species out of all of the species from one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world is kind of a hard list to make. Um, this audience, I'm guessing, is probably pretty well aware of how biodiverse our area is, but just to give a few examples of our abundance, um, there are more species of fish in the state of Tennessee than in all of Europe. Um, there are nearly 10,000 known species living in Southern Appalachia and there are more discovered every year. And so to get that down to 60, we chose some of the most beloved and recognized species from the region and then some of the most surprising or endangered or bizarre, um, such as a moss that uh, there are actually no photographs of. So that was a challenge for the visual artist, uh, a rare moss, but uh, he rose to the occasion, drew it without much information to go on. <laughs> Um, and then a final concern that I'll mention in this editorial process was the diversity of human contributors. Um, Appalachian writing and Southern writing in anthologies and textbooks, I think I can say is largely been represented by white men. Um, I know that the anthology I had in, as an undergraduate of Southern writing wasn't all that long ago, I think had one woman and one person of color in it. So I'm obviously aware that that's not actually representative of the population of the region or of who is creating art in the region. So that was something that we wanted to try to balance out in our representation of Southern Appalachia as well. I'm wondering if just to sort of get the conversational element of this evening going, if anybody would be willing to chime in and just tell me like maybe what you think of when you hear the phrase Southern or Appalachian writing. And if it's a stereotype, that's fine. But just like, what do you associate with those? And if you're shy, you can use chat. I'll kick things off. I guess my mind immediately goes to folk songs. Um, you know, the old tunes you hear back here that when, when I was growing up, I associated with the mountains. Um, which isn't writing in the, the most literary of terms, but still representative. And I have to say that one of my favorite Southern writers is Ron Rash, who is dark. And so I think <laughs> of Southern Appalachia as being a dark sort of genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true that a lot of, I mean, and that kind of goes together because a lot of ballads are pretty, pretty dark. Um, so that's, if, if we are sort of building off the, uh, the, the musical tradition and our, and our literary tradition, that makes sense. Um, and I do think that, you know, the, that musical background can be really important to informing um, Appalachian writers still I'll talk about myself for a minute here, but my uh, previous book, um, It's Day Being Gone, took that phrase from, from a ballad and it used some phrases from ballads in what I hope was contemporary way um, in, in different points in the book. So yeah, I think that, that that's a really, um, 
kind of encouraging example of ways that um, associations with the South are still playing out in what's being written here today. Does anybody want, have any like sort of, we could go ahead and just like, you know, purge some, some sort of ne maybe negative notions of what Southern writing might be? In regards to the first question, um, Patricia did say John L. and Wilma mm -hmm. Dykeman as yes. names that came to mind. Those are some great examples. Thank you. Um, okay, <laughs> a little different there. <laughs> um, so, well, you all are being polite. So, but I will just borrow some examples that my um, creative writing students who are undergraduates in Alabama come up with because they're good at like they're good at coming up with the negative stereotypes. So, you know, it's all like cornbread and, and grandma and um, you know, sitting on the porch. I like, I love my grandmother. I like cornbread and I like sitting on the porch. But they would sort of throw out these phrases that you would expect to be in Southern poetry that seem kind of dated or that seem kind of, you know, just expected. Um, maybe not all that original. So I wanted to, in putting together this book, not tell people what they couldn't write about, but try to find some people who happen to be living in the Appalachian South who maybe weren't writing in a style that you would immediately just see and think, oh, that's Appalachian writing. So that was just like, you know, maybe not writing in vernacular. Some, some writers in here do use vernacular, but I just wanted to get a range. And so that was something else that we were thinking of. And I'm gonna try to ask you all some more, uh, put, put you on the spot questions. Um, see if you wanna answer these. If you don't, I'll answer them but <laughs> myself. But um, nature poetry, that is also a category that sometimes people have some preconceived notions of. Like what come, does anybody wanna volunteer what comes to mind when you just hear the phrase nature poetry? Lost. Yeah, yes. It's, it's you for like, I don't know, soothing and uh, vistas that are like uh, uh, calming, a kind of idea um, when in fact, um, it's really being corner. Um, so it's, it's kind of a contradiction because if you go into that corner, you do find some really nice things here, you know? So, um, but to answer your question on it, in general terms, I usually think of nature writing as being sort of um, calming or soothing or, I know, idealized, because actually it was that way for the Greeks too, which may be, you know, where some of these strands come from. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that, that it is generally thought of as meditative, you were saying calming yet soothing or um, romantic, which could be, uh, good or bad, if you say like romantic with a capital R or the lo lowercase r, but sometimes I do think that people conceive of nature poetry as so idealized that it is actually, you know, unrealistic or disconnected from what our experiences today might be. And that really hasn't been um, what I have found in, in reading lots of contemporary poetry that deals with nature. There are plenty of people, for instance, who are chronicling environmental degradation, but also that are, who are recording interactions with the natural world in all sorts of unexpected ways. Um, and, and, and even though nature is a timeless subject, who are writing about it in some pretty uh, original ways. So uh, those were some other things that we were looking for um, in our conversations with the poets we're working with this book is, you know, how can you make a nature poem be a nature poem, be about the species you know, that we've asked you to write about, but also be, be fresh um, in, in some way. Um, so I'm gonna put in the chat here, a link to where you can find some of the poems from this book that I'm talking about. If everybody doesn't see it pop up on the screen, chat should be somewhere in the right lower corner of your screen. And if you click on that link there, it will take you to Southern Humanities Review which is the literary journal that um, is based out of Auburn University that I am also a co-editor of. And so we were able to publish a selection from the book there. And I wanted to use the poems that are in that feature. So, you know, in case you don't actually have the book in hand, this is not a class, right? You don't have required textbook. Um, we can all sort of read along together. Um, and as I'm talking, I will also paste in links to individual poems that I am um, discussing. But if at any point, you know, you 
get lost along the way, you should be able to find the poems from this main feature page that I just put in chat there. And so I wanna start by first looking at the poem for the American chestnut, um, which you can get to by clicking on the illustration of the American chestnut on that page that I just linked, or here is the direct link. Okay, are people seeing that? Opening up those links, all working? Okay, so um, this poem is a charm for the chestnut. If you have the book, if you happen to have the book with you, it is on uh, page 17 by Annalena Phillips Bell. Um, I can get a volunteer to read this poem. No, that's a joke. Um, if this was a class, I would definitely make people read most of the poems, but this poem would be hard to read, <laughs> I think. Take a look at the first few lines here. Um, does anybody care to share just a first impression of this language? I mean, I'll, I guess I can try to read it in case anybody's still opening up their link, but flowerer, burrer, who grew and still grow, springing from centuries roots each year, thin stems, stubborn and glad, a green law of two leaves lifted to flutter and flare and yellow and fall over sloped forest floor, sapling it, sprouting be nearly, resistible, toughest nut, rising it after an devaster, sun seeking it, standant, repair, for resist. You might pronounce some of those words differently, but um, fair to say, I think this is not conventional language, standard English. Um, and if you read through this poem and get to the little note at the end, uh, the poet explains that she did research on the history of the chestnut blight and then favorable conditions for the chestnut and put the text into this online generator that's called, it's called the drivel generator. It, it sort of remixes or mashes up words. And she's from that, what was issued from the drivel generator, she put together a poem. So obviously this is not the most accessible nature poem and putting it first in the book was maybe a little bit of a weird move, but I thought it set an interesting tone to say, okay, here's somebody doing something that is um, a nature poem, but maybe not exactly what you would expect. Um, and while it maybe wouldn't be the first step, I would suggest that my undergraduate writing students take when they're trying to write a poem. Um, you know, you should probably learn to say things clearly in language before you break language. Uh, I do think that even if we don't understand this poem in as clear of a way as we might some narrative poems, um, it does communicate feeling. It's not just like a conceptual poem with, with no heart to it, in my reading at least. Does anybody have any observations about, um, yeah, just maybe like the, the feeling you get from this language? I started. it. I sort of felt like, um, to me, it feel well, I have, an, I studied English, of course. So I, uh, you know, you start with Chaucer and all that stuff. So it really uh, had an English feel to it, which I also, you know, would uh, associate with a chestnut just because of uh, longevity or, you know, that exists. Yeah, when I first got, I opened this uh, submission from Annalena, in my email inbox and just glanced at it, I thought, oh, she's written in Old English. That's the first thing I thought. I didn't know what I was gonna do with that, but she does have quite a scholarly background. I did put it past her and it took me a minute of reading it to be like, oh, this isn't, okay. This is not Old English. This is, I guess, very new English. Um, but it uh, it seems suitable yeah, to this idea of a charm for the chestnut. Um, there's something a little bit magical and inexplicable. We know that writing a poem for a species is not not gonna directly save it from a blight or environmental problems of other kinds, but it's still, a, it's, it's an exercise um, in really engaging with the subject matter, which is this chestnut. And I also think that it is, um, there are places, there are enough places in this poem that you can really read um, that it is, it doesn't shut me out. Like sometimes experimental poetry is really hard to access, but this still speaks to me because there are whole phrases that are recognizable, but also 
the, even the words that are kind of made up, you can see the parts that go into them. So for instance, each stanza ends in four resist, which you can see is a combination of forest and resist. Maybe if you don't see it the first time, you do a couple stanzas in. And so that feels like, you know, a way of articulating a wish. Um, it's not maybe quite as on the nose as say, you know, I want the forest to resist. It becomes compressed into that one word. Um, so that's an example of, of, yeah, an unusual nature poem, perhaps. Um, there's some other poems in here that might, you know, appeal to other readers in other ways that still aren't maybe romantic poems or, or nature poems in the in the classic sense. And so another one I want to look at, and I will read this one because um, it's got a great uh, sort of Appalachian voice to it, is Fox Heart by the poet Adrian Blevins. If you have the book, it's on page 68. If you don't, I will paste it in here as soon as I get my document open. Um, okay. There we go. It should show up there, the gray fox. There is no La Leche League in the Appalachian rainforest in my heart. There is no Gap, no Eileen Fisher, no Wi-Fi, no Dollar General. But for 500 million years at least, there was enough chestnut and little leaf sneezeweed and Carolina parakeet for everybody in the Appalachian rainforest in my heart. And in actual reality, plus megatons of satiny swarms of freshwater mussels, the pearly shells of which make good ashtrays, and southern bog lemming and woodland bison and elk and elk, plus the actual passenger pigeon and certain kinds of big-eared bats and shrews. But the freshwater mussels these days, like the wild leek and the mountain alder and the pirate bush, are turning to an invisible blur in the old rivers of the Appalachian rainforest in my heart. And in actual reality, not to even mention the shrimp-like crayfish that dare us to swallow live at 4-H to prove what hillbillies we were and how much we loved the forest and everything already dead and dying in it. So of course I stood there on stage in that hunting lodge and shut my eyes to imagine the gray fox also in my heart. And in reality, as the fox is one of the highest priests of all this listing, by which I just mean the main gumption behind it, mostly because she's still flourishing in her slide in the scattered bones like a fence-like outside, since she's too busy not to be messy and far too hungry not to sleep all day and hunt all night and too maternal and sneaky not to steal chickens for her pups and too curious not to stare at everything forever to discern it. The gray fox can even climb trees and is therefore also part coon and cat and I do mourn the mountain lion. I remember as a child bobcat's call and I do mourn never seeing a flying squirrel or a star-nosed mole or a bog turtle or a diamond darter or a spruce fir moss spider and hate not even knowing what a hellbender is. But still, I stood there on stage in that 4-H hunting lodge in my beloved Blue Ridge at the age of eight and shut my eyes to call up the gray fox hiding out in a little den in the shadow of my hillbilly heart to get the guts to open my mouth and swallow that crayfish live. So I could learn, I think, to bide my time till I could sing the story of our unforgivable sins and try and say what a fierce little for everything, at least our sorrow. Is. So this poem, you know, she admits the modern world. Um, we start off with a bunch of brand names, La Leche Lee, Gap, Eileen Fisher, in the Wi-Fi, etc. Um, and she throws those trademarky sorts of names in with lots and lots of names of natural species. Um, and to me, this makes me consider, you know, a larger ecosystem. Um, this poem is about the gray fox. It's at the heart of the poem. Not as much of the page is devoted specifically to the gray fox as there might be in some of the other poems in this book, but I still think it's enough about the gray fox. It's sort of showing the true context of this species and of course of herself too. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a poem with long sentences and those ampersands and everything's sort of running it together and, and forcing us to see um, connections. And I think it has a, a great, human element in the voice, you know, going back and seeing her childhood self um, and seeing how this environment helped form her, uh, but also in the fact that even if she's saying that things are dying out, 
And, you know, the next the last word of the poem is sorrow. It feels defiant to me. It seems like this voice is, is wanting to stand up to this loss. And that toughness is, it has got to be worth something, I think. Uh, and also I'll just point out on this poem, one of my favorite moments is um, at the beginning of the last stanza. So, and too curious not to stare at everything forever to discern it. And I think that that is really sort of the call to action of the poem more than, you know, go out and write this letter to the editor or whatever, which is also a good idea, but uh, it's a call to notice and see. And so that's really, I think the, that might actually be pretty romantic when you get down to it um, underneath the a kind of tough voice. Um, one of the puzzles that I think poets who were tasked with writing these poems faced and a puzzle that you may face if you write nature poems or, you know, or even just trying to write it about nature in your journal um, is figuring out how much of the human to put in a poem that is ostensibly about nature. Um, so if you're writing about a tree, you know, are you really writing about the tree because you're interested in the tree or are you using it as, you know, just an image that will help you get around to talking about your own feelings, which is what you're really concerned with. You, know, you often see a lot of poems, you know, the tree's green and tall and sort of vague. And then we get to the idea that the human feels insubstantial or short-lived or something in compared to the tree. And it seems like, you know, in some of those drafts, if, if you've ever written any like that, I have. Um, yeah, the tree isn't real and the human feelings are dominating. And so that's something I try to be aware of. If I'm using nature in a poem, um, or if I'm working with poets who are trying to use nature in their poems to guide them to actually discern it, actually share the page with it, actually pay attention to it in their writing. But on the other hand, um, we're humans and we're writing in human language for other human reading readers. And we don't need to completely knock ourselves out of the poem um, because then it might just actually be a field guide um, description of how to identify a species, right? There might not be a lot of uh, art to it. Um, and so I think it can be very useful to include some of yourself or some of some human character in a nature poem, um, a hint of why you're drawn to this particular subject matter, uh, because that's why your human reader will have some sort of emotional reaction to the poem. So I think that sort of balancing act is one thing that you know the poets were really grappling with because some of them got to choose a species if they were early in signing up for the project, they got to choose a species that they were fascinated with or already knew they had some great story or connection uh, with. And some people, you know, they signed up later and like, well, we have three species left. Have you ever heard of the blue crayfish? Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> here you go. Research the blue crayfish and uh, I hope you, hope you find something. So you know, people had different experiences um, with this, but everybody came through with their own way of connecting with material. Um, I want to look at, now that we've looked at a, a fox, I want to look at another tree poem that takes kind of a different approach than the chestnut one. If you have the book, um, I want, it is Melissa Range's poem for the tulip poplar and it's on page 51. If you do not have the book, I will paste a link here. Okay. That is the one for the tulip poplar there in chat. And I, unless anybody's dying to read a poem aloud, I'll read this one. Um, it's another one with a good, strong uh, voice of, of a female poet with some, with some attitude who comes through. I liked its fox-headed look, its four-peaked leaf whiskering up at the tips. I liked its hell no height. So tall, I couldn't reach a branch, even with a boost. I liked it best goldfinch bright, yellower than the ribbon we left knotted around it all one year. I liked penciling poplar in the book I made in seventh grade, which contained the leaves of 35 East Tennessee trees and no actual knowledge of trees, or else I would have written Magnolia, my fake poplar's family name, that waxy genteel name I like to mock. I was proud that our state tree could grow on mountains, in hollers, in my yard, one dog or another chained to it, in any shit field from one end of the state to another. Proud it wasn't soft, like moonlight roping through branches, 
in a habitat only real on a TV screen. We never used and never knew its proper name and didn't want to know. My grandfather, its names were shutters, shingles, cabinetry. For my father, its names are the names of 40 years of dogs. For me, its names become the pulp left in my mouth from some country club south, gracious with trees I hadn't seen and didn't want to see. I thought it was a harder wood than what it was because it had to be. Does anybody want to share any reactions to that poem? Like this is, um, I mean, I'm just leave it kind of wide open for a minute, like a line or phrase that you just liked or that sounded good or that you don't understand anything. This is Karen. I think you can tell that this woman really lived with her poplar trees. She she really liked those. She identified with them. Yes, I think identified is an important word there. So it's sort of a poem that's about lack of knowledge in that, you know, she says, I didn't have any actual knowledge of trees in my book. I got the name wrong. I didn't care to know its actual name, but that's all kind of bluster that's on the surface, right? Because it's like there's a real attachment and caring underneath. Um, so it's, it is very connected to her identity and to her family, even though some of the qualities she gives of her family are maybe not the things we would typically think of boasting about. So um, there are some great phrases that sort of convey a blue collar attitude in here. You know, it starts out with a hell no height, that kind of refusal. And, you know, she, she, it's a shit what is it, a shit field, and there are dogs tied to the tree. So it's not really beautiful, um, but, and it's all on a TV screen, so that's not really ideal, but I mean, that is a way of, of seeing the nature, I guess. Uh, but through that comes her relationship with it, um, and the fact that there were human uses for this tree, shutters, shingles. Um, again, maybe not ideally, nature poem material to be cutting down the tree, but that is definitely a way of interacting with the tree and of knowing something of the quality of its, you know, its wood, it, those things. Um, and so she doesn't end up rejecting the tree, right? She still seems um, allegiant to it. Anything else you noticed about this poem that, um, I don't know, like maybe elements of the sound that were, we talked briefly about music in the beginning. I think this poem's kind of musical. Did, Anybody notice musical elements? While folks are compiling their thoughts, um, Janaea, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, said this one really spoke to me, shows how one can live as a neighbor oh. to a species, use it for their purposes and not really know it in an ecological niche sense. Oh, I see that in chat. Thank you for pointing that. I was trying to watch chat and then I missed and I missed a good one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, even, in that ending, I thought it was harder wood than what it was because it had to be. She's still talking about sort of her mistake that she made in understanding it, but yet she really is understanding it like at an emotional level because it feels to me at that point that she is talking about how probably how she had to be. Like she had to be hard to survive in this same thing that she placed that she wouldn't have known was an ecological niche at that point, but kind of was. Um, and I like how the, that ending, um, we could say hammer is the message in, which makes sense with this poem about building with the, that sort of uh, rhyme. Didn't want to see, had to be, it's subtle, it's internal rhyme, but those are the little things um, that really imbue this poem with, with a feeling um, that goes beyond like, any direct statement of meaning that it makes. And the other thing I would just point out in this poem is how many of the sentences and phrases begin with I, over and over, if you scan this poem, I liked, I liked, I liked, those are the first, that's actually all one really long sentence um, through the word mock, but with the, after each semicolon, we've got an I liked, and then I made, I was proud. And so um, all those assertions of I, which also comes back in the last sentence of the poem, I thought, um, we might think, you know, that's sort of selfish, you, know, all, you don't want to start every sentence in your poem with I when it's supposed to be about something else, but it seems integral to this poem because it's about a young person sort of discovering and asserting their identity. 
So yeah, I just think she's negotiating an interesting relationship with nature and observation of nature in here. Um, I had some, we're moving along here through our time. So I had some other poems I was going to discuss, um, but I'm thinking that maybe I would take a break pretty soon to let you do a little bit of writing. So I'm just gonna zip through a couple of these and then give you some things to think about in terms of observing or writing uh, yourself. One link I wanted to share with you, um, if you're interested in looking at it later, is um, a link to the poet Nicole Brown um, reading her poem, which is, is linked from Southern Humanities Review, um, but for the, well, what we call the pack rat, the, the wood rat, um, because she, in that poem, does a lot of talking about her own experience. Um, and in order to illustrate that, um, she actually made her own video. She talks about her curly hair. And um, for those of us who have curly hair, it can be rather traumatic uh, when you're young. Uh, and it, for this video, she actually brushes out her curly hair while she's reading it. Um, so again, here I, I'm flopping around with my documents here, trying to get the link for you, but I will put that in. I would encourage you to watch her read her own poem later. Um, and then I also want to just point out um, that some of these poems are in the book and the ones that are available in the online sample that I've, I've provided from Southern Humanities Review are really engaging a lot with form. Um, so that's the link to Nicole's poem about the, the pack rat there in uh, chat. But other poems um, in here are, well, maybe not totally traditional, uh, they are formal poems. So the American Caterpillar Fungus poem, when you look at that, um, you may be able to see that it is a sonnet, if you can dredge that up from, you know, English class or whatever, or maybe you read sonnets all the time. But it is 14 lines and it has the last two lines rhyme with each other. Uh, so for the, the Volta, the nice little closure. So you might look at that and think about, um, yeah, how these poets are engaging not only with their immediate surroundings, but also sort of their larger literary environment and tradition. And then there is one um, that I'm gonna share with you that isn't in the link um, that I have to Southern Humanities Review, but that I'm, it, you can see it in Google Books. So I wanna share that one with you. Uh, just because it's interesting. Let me get that up for you. It is by the poet uh, Glynis Redman, and it is called um, Living Jazz. And it is a poetic form that is called a golden shovel, which is, a, I think, an invention of the last, I don't know, decade maybe, uh, by the poet Terence Hayes. And it's this form that uh, took a famous poem by the poet um, Gwendolyn Brooks, which you may be familiar with because it's really in a lot of textbooks and things, but We Real Cool. And it is, I'll also put the link for that. So it is this short, short poem. Um, we, let's see. Okay, We Real Cool. Oh, my links are calling you I'll put that up for you. And then it will make more sense. Sorry about that. But anyway, so um, the way this form works is it takes the words of this short poem, We Real Cool. And it uses those words as the end word of um, a, a line in an original poem, which seems kind of impossible until you do it. Uh, but lots of poets have done it, including uh, Glynis Redman, who was contributing this poem about the ginseng. So here is the rules for writing a golden shovel. And then I'm gonna put up a link to the poem um, that inspired all this by, um, Gwendolyn Brooks. It's on the Poetry Foundation website. Slow technology. So here, this is one, that one there by Gwendolyn Brooks um, is the original. So if you look at that and see, it's a really short poem. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight. We sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. And then you look at that poem by Glynis Redmond that I put the link to in Google Books, um, which is a much longer poem about ginseng. And you trace down the right hand margin, you can see that the words from Gwendolyn Brooks' poems, poem ends those lines. So that's something that if you're interested in form, um, you might try. Just choose a poem that you really like 
and choose a line from it and try to incorporate that vocabulary in your own work. And I wanted to point out some of these formal poems just quickly because I don't know, I think some of this audience might have sort of a, a biological leaning, perhaps more than a literary leaning, who knows, but some, seeing these interactions between different poets writing sort of in, this, in response to each other seems sort of ecological to me in a way. Uh, so anyways, take a look at that maybe after we finish talking. Um, but I wanna shift a little bit and show you some ways that I have used these poems, um, the poets contributed to the book to help other writers um, continue creating nature poems about Southern Appalachia and elsewhere. Um, so I have another, yet another link to share with you. Uh, this is a selection of writing prompts that were created in response to this book. And um, if you click on it, there will be more here than you can do in the time that we have, but I just wanted to talk about some of these possibilities. So everybody got that link, the writing prompts and teaching tips. So if you open that up, um, there will be, on, on one column, there are prompts that are based specifically on poems that are in the anthology. And um, some of those you can do using the ones that, are, that I've already given you links for, um, and others you might need to actually have the book for. But so for instance, it gives you some ideas for how to build off the chestnut poem. It gives, it has, those links again for writing a golden shovel or some other uh, formal poems. And some of the poems that we didn't get to really talk about today, but that are available online um, are like, there's the poem about the wild turkey, which is a really, really short little poem by the poet Rebecca Gale Howell. And so it's just trying to write a really short poem like hers and then trying to write a longer poem. Like there's a, um, a poem for the Chucky Mad Tom, which is a really intensely researched, uh, really sweeping poem. So you could look through these um, prompts that are based on poems on the in the left column and maybe try those on your own time. What I wanna ask you to do to take just for a few minutes here is to look at the nature observation tips, which are in the right-hand column, um, because these might be useful even if you're not a poet, but maybe you just wanna, you know, take, write some notes about your surroundings. Um, and again, some of these will be better for you to do in the future if you're interested, but one, some of the ones that you could try now um, are making comparisons. So one way to get some notes that can create richer writing and observations is to look at two things instead of one. Because if you just look at a leaf and it's your normal-ish little oval-ish leaf, you may not have much to say about it, but if you look at it next to another leaf, then you can say it's thicker or it's actually this one's pointing here or this one's serrated or there may be words that are actually used in keying plants and identifying them or there may be more creative things to come in mind. So that's one thing you could do is compare. Another thing I suggest is that you can measure and count and get really specific. So as a writer, um, I don't always tend to be much of a numbers person. So I might, you know, but if I say that a leaf is big, it's not necessarily really exciting um, to the reader. But if I say exactly how many millimeters it is, or if I can compare it to something, or if I can say instead of there are millions of leaves on the ground in fall, I can actually count how many are in a square foot and say there are 115, you know, that's a lot more evocative uh, for the reader. Um, and then another thing I suggest that's pretty easy is to get out of just relying on vision. Um, so to take note of the smell and the feel, for instance, of a leaf, you could, if you know it's not poisonous, you know, you could taste it too. That you try to not rely only on one sense. So we, I know we're, we're gonna wrap up um, in a few minutes, but I'd like everybody to just take, look out a window if that's what you got, dash out the door if you can, turn off your camera if you have it on and want to, but take, um, I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna say, we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm gonna say five minutes, just see what you can do in five minutes. Grab a leaf a, you know, or two or a blade of grass, go out, count something, measure something, just gather a sensory impression and come back to us with, with something you can report in five minutes.
we'll keep time. Okay, I'm really impressed with people who managed to write 
something in five minutes. I'm not that fast of a writer. <laughs> um, so if anybody isn't looking at the stuff in the chat, I recommend that you do so, um, because we've got some nice examples here. So Katrina says uh, sassafras is the uh, leaf that she was looking at. And so um, three leaves, pointing out the, that distinctive thing that the, the, you know, what plant has three different kinds of leaves on the same plant? There's a lot you could do with that. Um, mitten, glove, and, and finger mitten. Um, I think that probably a lot of us see the, the mitten when we look at the, those leaves, but then she sort of takes it to the next step, goes much, much bigger than that. And then in the example that we have below the uh, phlox bloom, um, this writer is really taking the next step in describing the, the flower and then associating a personal memory. Um, and really we've got sound in there. Um, we've got at least a metaphor for taste. So yeah, that's what I was gonna suggest that you all do next when you come back with your observation is okay, maybe if you have some sort of data, right? It's this big or it has this quality. How do you next associate that with a metaphor or with a personal narrative? And so it's really nice to see some people already doing that. Um, oh yeah, and here we've got another one. Grayson, red, doveys, and black-eyed junco and chippy. So we've got birds here and, and then um, sort of yeah, reveling in the name and then good work there with, with the setting, you know, putting the, the evening in the grass so we really have an atmosphere. Um, okay, yeah, it's nice to, uh, okay, and they're searching in the grass. Does anybody want to share anything that they observed out loud? Anybody who's not a chatter? Well, thank you to those of you who did Oh, there we go, some sycamore leaves. Um, decaying and lacy, but feels like rough, worn hands. Just barely not symmetrical with 12 peaks on its edges. Yeah, so those are great notes too. Lacy, um, already, already going metaphorical, rough, like worn hands. Um, is a nice contrast to lacy. Uh, you know, we think of lace as fancy, whereas the roughness of the hands is, is a little unexpected, but yet you can see how those fit together. Um, barely not symmetrical. And then we have, yeah, like the, the numbers, 12 peaks, so the counting, the close observation. And so I would take just because this is the one that's in, in front of me uh, as an example going forth. So like Emma could, um, if she, okay, she's not doing that in the next chat. I want to make sure but 12 peaks on his edges. Like that would be something to keep thinking about as you come back to these notes, if you want to write something more. So, you know, what is, what do I want to say about those 12 peaks? Um, how can how can I continue sort of pushing each natural observation uh, to a, like another level of association? Uh, so there's some great material to work with here. We also have a tulip tree um, and the flat leaflet. The questions: Did it stub its finger and live to bear the scar? That's nice. Creating kind of um, rather than a scientific explanation, more of like a sort of mythic uh, explanation. Uh, I think questions can be a really good way to engage with natural material. So that's nice to see as well. All right, thank you. I'm impressed that you managed to generate that much in that short of a time. Does anybody have any um, other observations they wanna share or questions that they wanna ask for regards to reading any of that stuff? Okay, well, in closing, I would just say that um, I encourage you to go back to some of uh, those links that I shared and sort of try reading uh, the poems again um, with the exercises alongside them, because um, I think that trying to do some of your own writing as you read poetry is one of the best ways to get into it and to actually understand what other poets are doing as well as generating your own work. And then hopefully that I that is tied um, as a practice to just nature observation and awareness of your surroundings and environment um, in general, when you're sort of going around with that writer's eye. So thank you all for uh, spending time uh, reading and writing today.
Thank you very much for being here, Rose. I did see a few people unmute themselves, I think. Oh, right at the end there. So I don't know. Uh, Come back. Yeah, if you, if you have something to say, I'm not going anywhere. So if anybody We've wants got to say time. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, I thought, I thought that was very, very interesting. And I actually bought the book yesterday. So I've been enjoying it. And uh, I think it's an excellent idea. And I noticed that there apparently was one done for the Sonora Desert area. Is that correct? And I can see that, you know, once more people become aware of it, that that it would be a good thing, you know, across the country for people to become engaged. And uh, so I just wanted to say I really appreciate it. It was really very, very enjoyable to listen to you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. I'm interested to see the like the books that get published about it, but I also kind of like the idea of people doing their own little ad hoc ones. You know, if you just did it for your own community, maybe you know, no press ever publishes it, but it would be just an interesting little thing to compile for a small area too. Mm -hmm. I agree. I wondered if, um... oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I wondered if, if you ever make a distinction between say nature poetry and poetry of the wild, because there are various traditions, but, uh, and especially like, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, ancient Chinese rivers and mountains poetry, I'm sure you are, but um, where the wild is more, uh, you don't, a man or the person, the human doesn't interfere uh, or push themselves on it. And I also was re reading, I think it was a, lovely uh, poem by either a Whitman today that was like, all you need to learn if you just go and sit and listen, you'll learn what you need to know about a place. And so I just wondered how, um, how if you, if the notions of wildness, which is maybe what we're losing here, I'm speaking to you from the Franklin area, but you know, with development and that's everywhere happening, but, uh, you know, people are really imposing, you know, imposing on the, those little wild places, you know? So I wondered if there's sort of a distinction you make there. Um, there are lots of discussions about this, yeah. And so um, nature poetry is kind of a catch-all phrase. Um, and so if I was going to get specific about it, I think that there's, you know, there's environment, people might have different terms, but there's environmental poetry, which is more sort of your call to action, politically motivated poetry. And there is um, eco poetry, which is what I would probably say, you know, if, in a more literary context, what I write, which is about, you know, it's observe, sort of observing the contemporary context with the environment um, and certainly, you know, acknowledging the issues and degradation going on. Um, and there's a lot of conversation around eco-poetry about yeah, how much role to, should the human have in poetry about the natural world. But that's sort of, that's a, a contemporary area of poetry that interests me. And then there is, I think, nature poetry understood in the way that you were talking about, um, which probably cultures other than American literary traditions are better at doing this sort of actually looking at nature without the wild, without observing, our, without inserting ourselves so much. Um, so yeah, there are definitely lots of different uh, understandings of what nature poetry means and different sorts of names for schools that are, people are using out there. Um, it gets a little muddled sometimes, I think, but it's, inter it's an interesting discussion. Um, in my personal opinion, it's impossible for me to write about nature without inserting myself in some way just because I'm using language, you know, <laughs> uh, human language. Uh, but I, I do think it's... Um, a worthwhile pursuit to look at poets who really try, try not to interfere with that wildness too. Yeah, or at least wait and listen, let it this speak to you first or something like that. But I love your term. I like the way, I'm glad you brought up eco poetry too. That's a really important term to add to the mix. Thank you so much. Really lovely presentation. Yeah, um, if just one last uh, recommendation. There's a book called the Eco Poetry Anthology, which was co-edited by Laura Gray Street and the reason that she's the co-editor of this book is because I really like that anthology. I didn't know her. And so I just sent her an email and said, hey, she want to edit a book with me. But that book, the Eco Poetry Anthology, which is a big fat book, 
um, it is from Trinity University Press, and it gives them a much longer um, sort of historical context. And it has some really great definitions of categories of, of nature poetry in the introduction. So that's a, there's, it says some smart stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, I would like to um, finish this off by highlighting John Ayer's uh, comment, the older I get, the more I realize so, that so many of my childhood memories are associated with the nature experience. Um, I think that's probably true for many, if not all of us. So thank you help, for helping us to <laughs> Rose is saying yes herself as well. Um, thank you for introducing us to your wonderful book and walking us through your poems and the process. I know I certainly enjoyed it. If y'all watching the videos kind of tell, um, I'm glad that you all did as well. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you do not already own it, a literary guide Build Guide to Southern Appalachia is available for purchase here in our Nature Center gift store. You're more than welcome to stop by during our open hours to buy one and support not only Rose, but also the foundation. And if you'd like to support the foundation in other ways, you can become a member or make a donation on our website. Uh, we really appreciate your support. You make all of this possible. Looking ahead to futures on our lectures, you can find all the details for this year's on our website, including the locations. Please note they are changing every from week to week. Um, you can also stay up to date by signing up for eBlast. You can also do that through our website. Our next Sonner lecture will be here at the station, our first in-person one since 2019, and it will be in the meadow behind the Nature Center with a reception to follow. Dr. Hilary Swain of Archbold Biological Station will be joining us to talk about cowboys and scientists coupling ecosystems and agriculture in Florida ranch lands. Many thanks to the Stowers, Harrisons, Daughtrys, Wards, and Conleys for supporting this particular lecture. We hope to see you. I am personally very excited about having our first persons on our lecture. Um, if you are unable to attend, attend, we will be making every effort to record our futures on our lectures this year, both the in-person and the virtual ones. And if we are able to do so, they will be available on our YouTube page where you can find not only this year's, but also last year's and our other virtual programming. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you at our futures on our lectures this year. Take care all and thank you again, Rose. <laughs>